Okay, so we have to finish off section 31 point, I don't even know where we are. I guess we're going to talk about, oops, that's the other part of stuff we have to talk about later. Oops, this is even the wrong chapter. This is stuff we have to talk about later. Uh, I don't remember what section, so we're just going to not put a section number and say that we're going to start talking about cancer. Cancer is one of those things where uh, the basic understanding of it is pretty solid, meaning uh, we kind of know what's going on. It's getting the details that are causing lots and lots of trouble in research. So how many people know someone who has cancer or is related to someone with cancer? Yeah, basically it's one of the leading causes of death. And, you know, any research that uh, produces cures for that or something like that is obviously going to have a profound effect on human life. So what is cancer exactly? It's uh, cells that... It's a mutation occurs. Yeah, a mutation occurs which causes... I won't say totally unregulated, but maybe we should say misregulated, but causes unregulated slash uncontrolled growth. So everyone probably has that basic idea or definition down. And we can add a bunch of words to kind of go one level de of detail deeper. But beyond that, it's, you know, it's going to be tough, I meaning you have to start getting into the nitty gritty details of it. So let's just start with some words that we need to know, oncogenes. These are actually the genes that protect you. So they're proteins that code for cell growth. So those are the ones where if a mutation occurs, so a mutation in the DNA causes the oncogenes to misfunction, oncogenes. And that idea of a mutation, well, that has lots of different possibilities. One of the things that we always talk about is something is carcinogenous. Carcinogens. What does a carcinogen really mean? Something that can cause cancer. Basically something that can cause a mutation. So what are some examples of carcinogens? Yeah, UV light can damage DNA. Uh, I was going to write damages DNA, but that's what all of this does, right? <laughs> so. Maybe it would be a little redundant to write it down from other ones. What are some other examples? Viruses. Yeah, viruses can actually damage your DNA. Radiation. radiation. That's sort of the same thing as UV. Um, different types of radiation, though, but probably worth mentioning, too, since a lot of you are going to be dental hygienists. One of the reasons they try to limit x-ray exposure is every time you give someone an x-ray, there's a small increased chance that they'll get cancer. Now, how big of a chance is that for your average lifetime of dental x-rays? Probably save more lives than you'll cause cancer on something like that. Melissa, are you sick? No. Just checking. I'm actually impressed that no one in class got sick from Jess's crap. Uh, what are some other causes of carcinogens? Good morning, Jasmine. So there's a lot of chemicals that cause it. Uh, you know, things like benzene, carbon tetrachloride. Heck, we used to play with this stuff. It's so much fun. But uh, they got rid of it now. In fact, it's actually worth money on the black market from what I understand. But CCL4, carbon tetrachloride. Um, we used it actually in PCHEM to do phase transitions because if you use an ethanol ice water bath, it undergoes two solid phase transitions, so you can actually see it change from one solid to another. And so it was useful because it had such a clear phase transition for that. A lot of other compounds that have multiple phases, like, you know, carbon can make both diamonds and graphite, right? 
a little hard to demonstrate turning graphite into diamonds into a lab, but you could easily demonstrate the two solid forms of, say, carbon tetrachloride in the lab and even go into the liquid state. Whereas, for instance, it's, you know, we don't go into the liquid state for carbon. So I don't know if I should say everyone played around with it. How about chemists played around with it? Certainly we know that there's a lot of compounds in smoke, particularly cigarette smoke, that causes cancer. So smoking's bad for you. And there's lots of other things that can also cause carcinogens. Uh, it's fairly well regulated nowadays as far as putting it on labels and trying to cut back on things like that. So what really happens is we cause the oncogenes to either misregulate the cell growth or generally what happens is we have unregulated or that leads to unregulated cell growth. Now what's kind of neat is at some point people thought there were certain genes that caused cancer and it's more the fact that certain gene lacking certain genes cause or can cause cancer to be more likely to occur. So there's these tumor suppressing genes. So your body is like a well-regulated machine in that, you know, there's the initial oncogenes that control everything, but there's also what we would call maybe like policeman genes, meaning genes that make sure that the oncogenes actually perform as specified. So these tend to block cancer development. Develop, I don't know, I don't care about spelling. Development, and by uh, regulating, or by, I guess maybe we should say, um, by terminating cells, terminating cells that show, mis show unregulated growth. Basically, you can think about them as the policeman for oncogenes. And it turns out that when you have no cops, what do you have a lot of? Crime. Or in this case, you're right, unregulated cell growth. For instance, there's 20 plus genes that have been identified. And a lot of these genes, if you're missing them, so if you're missing the gene, it leads to a specific type of cancer. And they're often fairly rare. And the reason they're rare is that if you get the cancer before you have kids, you don't pass the gene on. So, you know, they're reasonably rare. Um, an example of this is that what they call the P53 gene is inactive in 50% of cancers. So, for instance, if we could find a way to genetically activate the p53 gene, that's not going to necessarily cure cancer, but it has the likelihood of caught preventing or delaying the onset of cancer for a good amount of people. Same thing with a lot of those other other parts. Certainly. Oops. Got to hit the button actually. Trying to think of anything else happened exciting this weekend. It snowed. That was exciting. I did my taxes finally. Oh, so they thought it might have been your grandma or something? No, they just like the Senate, they called the town. Oh, okay. A little depressing, too. Oh, that's good. What about cancer treatments? This is uh, something that pe some people probably have, I won't say personal experience with, since I hope no one here has cancer, but certainly relatives or friends. What are some ways to treat cancer? Yeah, radiation, chemotherapy. So how do they manage to kill cancer? Why does radiation 
prevent cancer or cure cancer or kill it at least. Okay, so Same. Like general, yeah, damages cells and kills them. And the key here is that cancer cells reproduce faster than normal cells. So the idea is that if you can stop the cancer cells from reproducing, but the other cells have time in which to reproduce or you know, go undergo meiosis and mitosis and all that good stuff, then you won't have done it. So my general take on this is that you kill the person, kill the, the person or the cancer and the person, and hope the person lives. That really seems to me to be kind of some of a lot of the current treatments is basically really saying, let's kill everything and hope the person lives after that. And it works, I don't know, it depends on the type of cancer, whether it works very well or not. Some other treatments that are more promising or at least hopeful in the future are what they are what I said before is like, for instance, to activate the tumor suppressing genes. Meaning if we can activate those genes, we can prevent a lot of cancers from even occurring in the first place. Certainly there's prevention, which is basically to limit DNA damage. So for instance, you know, we have sunscreen, we have dosage limits for radiation. Like, did you know that simply living in Denver increases your chance of getting cancer? Simply because we're at a mile high, we have a mile less atmosphere than someone living at sea level. So simply choosing to live in Denver or the, the you know, Colorado area at higher elevations, you're actually choosing to have an increased risk of cancer. So we've got, let's see, dosage limits for, um, we've got, you know, regulations on chemicals to remove uh, all carcinogenic chemicals from things. Um, you have to have giant warning labels on stuff and things like that. There's some unique ones that they're trying to do, and this is actually a form of chemotherapy, but they use something called 5-fluorouracil. I think it's kind of interesting that we've managed to make drugs like this don't have to memorize the structure. Maybe the concept is worth remembering, just like all of these concepts. So this is basically uracil with a fluorine attached. And what this does is this is basically allosteric hindrance. And that this inhibits thiamine production. And so if you insert a bunch of this into the cells that contain the DNA, or the, I mean, sorry, into the cancer cells, then they'll try to incorporate the uracil into the DNA. That won't function. And it'll block the, the production of thiamine and so that the cell can't reproduce. Hindrance? I was on the last test, allosteric regulation, where methods by which we can regulate biochemical pathways. So essentially what this does is it, it prevents thiamine from being produced in your body. And if there's no thiamine, then you can't reproduce the DNA. Hindrance? Regulation, you could use either word. I don't think it makes a huge difference. So cancer is a huge area of research. I didn't do it this year. Some years I, I like will uh, post a bunch of articles and or photo op copy off another. There's always some article in uh, the news about some new cancer drug or new step in cancer research or something to do with this. 
if I had to pick the number one like hot topic in biology, it's always something to do with uh, uh, DNA and using that to cure, cure or solve diseases or problems. Probably the root of that was the Human Genome Project. To me, this is kind of like the space landing of biology. Meaning, it, you know, nowadays we take it for granted, even though we don't take exactly going to the moon for granted. But um, I think it's pretty impressive. So it was established in 1988 when they sought to map the three billion base pairs. of the human genome. <coughs> and it was finished in 2001, actually. Now this is, of course, it's finished for an individual. Certainly there are variations between individuals and lots of other things that we can do. But, you know, for a project that seems daunting, three million base pairs is a lot, Turns out that with the advances in techniques and things like that, we could probably sequence that in a matter of months, what took them nearly a decade to do. And if we take a look at the DNA code, they estimate that it should code for 100,000 plus proteins. But what we really find is that there's only about 23,000 proteins coded for. Sometimes I think that number 23,000 sounds really big. I mean, if I asked you to memorize the name of 23,000 things, that would be a lot. Sometimes I think it's actually kind of tiny, because I think of the complexity of the human body and go, sometimes 23,000 sounds like a lot, sometimes 23,000 doesn't seem like it's enough to encode an entire human being to a certain extent. And what they found is that approximately 98% of the genes don't code proteins. And so they have what we would say is an unknown or no function, meaning they're not sure yet. They've actually started to realize that some of it is for regulation. So you know, they've proved that some of that junk DNA is actually used to regulate the whole process. Some of it is what they call simply junk DNA. They think it's basically unused, oops, okay, did I crash it? No. Unused or abandoned genes. Meaning it might have coded for something at one point, but no longer codes for anything. It might have been corrupted at one point and then is no longer used or replicated. God bless you, Jess. And so even though we've got three billion base pairs, not all three billion are useful. Not all three billion are necessary. Good grief. And the reason why this is important is that genetic diseases, diseases that can be linked to one pro or improperly or one or more improperly expressed proteins affect about 8% of humans. So 1 in 10. Now we have a really small class, so I have no idea. Does anyone have a genetic disease that they know of? And not all these genetic diseases are simply going to cause you to die. Uh, some of them can be simply lactose intolerant. That would be, yeah, I was going to say, I thought it was Aaron. Does anyone else have anything like that that they know of, that they uh, got from their parents along with you know, the rest of the package? Yeah, one of the things that they're thinking of doing these days is simply doing a genetic assay on every individual and handing you a little scorecard that says, these are the things you're most likely to die from. Kind of depressing, if you ask me personally. But maybe useful in that you can take additional precautions. 
there's over a thousand plus diseases that we can test for now. And of course, like I said, these are simply potential or risk factors. There's actually no guarantee that you'll get anything. Now, theoretically, it's easy to cure. In that it's very possible if that we can identify the gene that is damaged that we should be able to reconstruct that genetic material and insert it in the human body. Certainly we can already do that with a lot of proteins in bacteria and things like that. In fact, we use bacteria nowadays to produce lots and lots of different uh, uh, proteins and things like that. One of the major ones is probably insulin for people. So it's easy to cure theoretically, it's difficult in practice, at least in humans. I mean, like I said, meaning we've worked on and done quite a bit with plants, we've worked on and done quite a bit with bacteria and things like that. But there have been some cures. They've cured the deficiency of adenine deaminase. Adenine deaminase deficiency. They, for instance, cured the boy in the bubble disease. And they're in clinical trials, which means they think they've got it worked out, but they're not so sure, or they're not sure if the side effects from it might be worse than the actual cause. Things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MD, muscular dystrophy. I'm feeling particularly lazy, not even going to bother spelling it. So there's a lot of potential there for a lot of things. And in fact, the whole idea of genetic engineering, the idea that we can basically take our genes and we can either fix them or nowadays might be the possibility of inserting new genes into people that allow better functioning. There's a whole series of TV shows that simply talk about that. How many people watched the X-Men movie? Yeah, X-Men is based on or predicated that uh, certain genetic codes or have been activated that are dormant in people and it gives them all of these wonderful superpowers. Uh, there's a lot of other shows that do it a lot more subtly in various things like that. I don't know, I was watching one this weekend. Has anyone ever watched Orphan Black? Has absolutely nothing to do with worrying about the genetic stuff other than the fact that it's a story about a bunch of people who are clones. And so what they did with the clones is they have you know, changed one small thing about each person, or at least tried to, to see how it would work out overall. So there's a lot of uh, miscellaneous topics, you can go ahead and read on that. Your book contains some additional information on like how it affects agriculture and how we can you know, code for resistance to uh, certain chemicals and uh, pesticides and how even now nature is responding by uh, making bugs that are immune to that. So we're right back to square one potentially. Okay, let's just briefly talk about the genetic code something that you almost always get in a uh, biology class, much more than you would ever get in chemistry to a certain extent. And the idea is that the sequence of the DNA corresponds to a sequence of amino acids. And in DNA, if you look at it, we really have only two base pairs. Technically we could say, I guess, well there's two pairs or four bases, take your pick. And there's over 20 amino acids. And so for instance, if each DNA code coded for one amino acid, you could only code for one amino acid. If you looked at pairs of DNA, meaning two, two uh, letters in a row, then you can code for, what is it, eight or sixteen. 
And it's only when you have three uh, codons, or three bases, sorry, three bases, which is what's called a codon, that you can start to code for 64 different um, molecules, I guess we could say. And so because there's only 20 amino acids, there are some codons called termination codons, which are abbreviated TC. There's a start codon. You guys know that one from Todd's class, right? AUG. Or does he not talk about some some of them use GUG, which actually codes for met and val. And table 31.1 lists them all or lists all the lists them. So you get that, of course, on a test. Did he give you the extra credit project to devise one of these tables? Or, or you know, sometimes he says he gives one class. I think it might be Bio 112. I don't remember which class he said he gives it to. But it makes him make like a decoder ring so that if you dial in the three amino acids, it gives you the correct answer. That's your class. Did anyone do it? OK, it seems like to me it would be, I don't know about easy, but it would be extra credit. So there's also redundancy built in in that some amino acids have multiple, in fact, most of them do, multiple codes. So an example of that, and this is on page 872, or go ahead and follow along on your cheat sheet if you want to. Oops. You can kind of see that list. And the only thing you really have to do in that is realize how to read that chart. And so there's a homework question on it, and you guys can just kind of do the homework question, see if you get it or not. We'll do one example. Someone give me three DNA letters in a row. Or what? A don't say A U G. We know that one. A G U. A G U. So the idea is that on that chart you look for the first, and that's broken into U C A G. So we'd come down here and choose the A row. And then for the second one. Each of those is broken apart into a further four columns, U, C, A, G. So then we'd be looking down here at the bottom row. Let's see, A, G. And then it's got A, C, or I'm sorry, we might as well do the right order. U, C, A, G across. And so then we follow that G row over until it connects with the U row. And that tells us that we are talking about what compound? Anyone following along? AGU is serine. Is that right or not? Yeah. Okay, just checking. And so we could do the opposite, which is say, okay, give me one of the codes for some other compound, but the, or some other amino acid, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the reason that we want to talk about it is simply that this is what codes for each individual amino acid and it's kind of the transition from talking about DNA and to talking about how proteins are actually synthesized. So what we want to look at next is the process <coughs> of translation. And this is the process by which protein or uh, DNA code is converted to proteins. And depending upon what book you read, they'll divide it up into a bunch of different steps. Your book calls it sort of three bold face steps, but it doesn't call it step one, step two, step three, except in the picture. And then it divides one of the steps into three sub steps. So realize that what I want you to focus on is sort of the way I 
put the numbers on so that when we make a reference to it on a test. But if, the te if I say, you know, on the test, discuss step two, and you're like, I forgot which one step two is. I'll tell you, step two is initiation. Now, does the book say step two is initiation? No. The book says step one is initiation. Well, that's okay, because I like to, well, actually, I should say maybe I do go what they do. I add a step, which is step zero, and I like to call that the preparation step. process by which DNA code is converted to a protein. And so what I call the preparation step is the behind the scenes stuff, meaning the stuff that they technically say has already occurred and so they start the sequence or the synthesis of proteins with that step of literally the first two connected together. But I'd like to go one step back and realize that we know that mRNA is what's transported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And there, it basically binds to five plus ribosomes. So remember, we said the mRNA is kind of like our blueprint. The five plus ribosomes are then the machinery. And remember, those rib ribosomes are held together by the rRNA. And so you've got this complex that you know, has a very specific shape and functionality of it's going to stitch together the protein. And like, for instance, you can see in uh, page 876, there's a diagram. I'll also put it up on the board here in a few minutes. But if you wanted to open your book to 876, you can follow along in the picture. I'm not going to draw the picture out. It would take me 20 minutes just to draw the stinking picture. But you can see, like, for instance, there they, they show the functionality of a ribosome as simply a blob. And so we're not going to worry about the details behind it, but we do want to know it's there. And it also shows us the role of all of those parts of RNA. What's the one I forgot? I shouldn't say I forgot. What's the one I'm going to do next? Yeah. Here in the preparatory steps, we can also say that TNR tRNA binds to specific amino acids. And we can take a look at how that works with a little bit of a chemical reaction. Now here's where you start cheating in biology. I drew the actual, well I drew a, a generic structure for an amino acid, meaning I just put a random R group on it. And then for tRNA, I just literally wrote tRNA, meaning there's not a lot of obviousness as to what happened in that reaction. And then the other thing we need is ATP. And as always, I kind of started off too much in the middle, so we'll do that. And this is a minus H2O reaction. We're not going to show the hydrogen on the tRNA, but where am I going to get the water on the amino acid? Yeah, so I'm going to lose this OH right here, plus AMP. And what's the difference between ATP and AMP? Yeah, phosphate. So two PIs. And remember, some books are going to show that as PI. Some will show it as PO4. If you're a chemist, they'll actually show it as PO4 minus 3. There's a lot of different ways they can show that. Some books actually draw the, stink, the molecules out, HO-P-O-P-OH, a bunch of double bonds to O, and an OH, and an OH. So all of that is just fancy ways of writing PI. I chose the easiest one. I probably should write PO4, or at least, you know, H2PO4 2 minus or something like that to show what it really is chemically, but I kind of take the lazy biologist ray and just write that it's phosphates. And so this process, of course, takes energy, right? Because ATP is our energy storage molecule. If we use up an ATP, then we use up energy. We'll get into more detail in that in our bioenergetics chapter in chapter 33, which is what we'll be starting in on Wednesday. 
So the other thing that's important to note is notice that this is the kind of the start end. So one of the reasons we always talk about amino acids as going from the end to the carp the end terminal end to the C terminal end is because simply that's the way the process actually works, meaning we're always adding on to that uh, C terminal end and not the end terminal end. So that's the preparation step. Well, so the idea is that that's where the tRNA is added, so we're going to add that next amino acid to that end. And really, I shouldn't even say that it's that obvious, because certainly by, because there's some compounds that will be act as handles, meaning if it's attached to that part of the molecule, that's the part of the molecule that reacts. There's other cases where attaching to that part of the molecule protects the molecule, and that's the part that doesn't react. But for most biological processes, where the molecule actually attaches is also the part that actually reacts first in the reaction. So you just kind of just start from whatever's in mm -hmm. So step one, and see your book doesn't even label it as step one except in the diagram, is called initiation. Now I will give your book credit, they actually put the word initiation in big bold faced letters, so that's okay. So AUG or GUG is where the process starts. Ugh. Now one of the big mysteries, as far as I know it's still a mystery, is there's always multiple examples of AUG, GUG in a protein. So the question is, how does it know where to start? Well, I guess maybe I should also say that this goes back to the idea of DNA going to mRNA. Meaning in the DNA code, there's lots and lots of examples of AUG and GUG. The question is, how does the, how, when you're going from that DNA step to the mRNA step, how does it know where to snip the mRNA? Because how do you tell where the first one is when you've got, now you don't have all three billion base pairs on the same DNA strand, obviously, but you know, how many ever hundred of millions you have in a row, how do you know which one is the start one when there's millions of them, right? So that's a question whether it's more than a single one that actually starts it or if there's something else in the molecule that just simply says this is the one that's actually starting. They don't quite know that yet, at least the last time I read the book or read the internet. And so, you know, maybe the next edition of the book will come out and they'll mention that this has been solved. It's hard to stay on top of all science changes in the history, which is why occasionally someone will tell me something that they learned in high school and be like, oh, they fixed that, cool. You know, because you got to remember when I was in high school, they were just starting the Human Genome Project and now they've finished it. So obviously in the last lots and lots of years, you can do the math if you want, uh, things have changed. Uh, so that's where the start is. So the initiator, tRNA, starts the reaction by binding the free amino end. And so if we take a look at it, what really happens is you've got your NH, CH, R, C double bond O dash tRNA. And what happens here is they actually bind an aldehyde group. So this aldehyde bonded to the end terminal end to prevent translation. So that's how they control the directionality. They simply cap or block that end. And really we could even say that here R is either MET 
or VAL, meaning you could draw that in if you wanted. I don't really care what it is. You guys are always free to use R any day of the week for most stuff with amino acids, unless asked to, do, to show something with an actual um, one. So step one only happens once because it's the initiation. Once you've started making the amino acid or the protein, then you no longer need to cap that amino, amino end. And in fact, that's not what you really want to do. So step two is the one that gets repeated over and over again. And that's called elongation. Elongation. So what we have is we have the tRNA that initiated it. hydrogen bonded to the mRNA. And then we have the next tRNA hydrogen bonded to the, net, to the mRNA. And so what you've got, and here's where we'll go to the picture. So maybe I'll pause a second while you guys write. So here's another good example of hydrogen bonding. And we can also point out that this is all complementary, meaning that it's complementary pieces of uh, the code, you know, G and C, T and A, that are um, causing that. And so here's where we'll go to that picture in the book, probably worth a thousand words, even though I'll probably say the thousand words anyway. So here's what we've been talking about. So, you know, this is your book's way of, here's that complicated ribosome structure that's actually five plus parts all held together by the rRNA. Notice that here's our strand of mRNA, and so it's broken it apart into little three-letter codes. Notice that here's the tRNA with that cross shape where this is the part that interacts with the uh, mRNA, the other end of it interacts with the amino acid, and then I called these sort of like the control arms. That actually interacts with the ribosome, even though it's not really shown in this picture because that's not what they're trying to kind of focus on. And so you can see here that here's all the hydrogen bonds showing the molecules connected together. And so here's you've got, you know, that initiation, meaning that's your first one. And then here's that second amino acid. And so the process that we're talking about elongation is the process by which these two are bonded together. And so the formation of the bond between the two amino acids is what we're really considering elongation. So elongation, it's the formation of the peptide bond between two adjacent amino acids. So what really happens is you form that bond and you also at the same time are releasing the tRNA again to be reused. So that tRNA, once it's you know, been uh, sort of a hydrogen bonded to that, then the ribosome kind of kicks it out and says, go find another amino acid and come back when you've done your job. Then the ribosome moves down the chain and repeats. So what you're constantly having done is the formation of a peptide bond, which is really what type of bond if we're a chemist, just for that record? What? Right, but I mean, as a chemist, we would say it's just an amide, right? So it's an amide bond or a peptide bond and kicks off the next one. So here you can see, you know, here's step two. Here's step two again, meaning they connect the next amino acid to it. Notice that here they're kicking loose that free tRNA. And then that process continues indefinitely. 
Uh, we should note that this also obviously should require energy and specifically uses GTP, which for our intents and purposes will treat exactly the same as ATP. It's simply the currency or the form of energy that we use. And then the last step, so step three, oops, oh, I suppose, uh, do I have enough room? Yeah, step three is not very big. Step three is called termination. And basically what it happens is when a stop codon or termination codon is reached, the process stops. And the process simply stops by having the last tRNA be hydrolyzed. So what happens is the ribosome re reaches the end of the molecule. The next amino acid isn't there because you've reached the stop codon on the mRNA. And so then that last amino acid has that tRNA removed by a hydrolysis reaction. That's simply plus H2O to make the amino acid in the free tRNA. So really, the most important step, I mean, they're all important, obviously, but the one that's repeated over and over and over again is elongation. And one of the things that I think is amazing about this, especially when you think about when we were talking about the enzyme chapter, how, how slow it is for humans to do this process. And let's just find a new slide or go back. Real quick review here. Can you read all that? Is that the process is super fast. Meaning that it takes about 60 seconds to make hemoglobin. Which is 146 amino acids. Or it takes 10 to 20 seconds to make most E. coli proteins. E. coli. Which are actually 300 to 500 amino acids long. And so something that we had said takes days and days and days, and you might be able to add one or two amino acids to a protein doing it in a beaker. Well, the biologists have it licked in that they have these very fast processes. They're very complicated, but they're very fast once you master them. So I think that's it for the chapter. What we're going to do then for the rest of the week is we, oops, that was the last slide. Good thing we stopped. We got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There's no class on Friday. On Tuesday, there's lab, but what it's really going to be is you guys are going to prepare to lecture on chapter 32, which is nutrition. So this is something I do every year. It's kind of interesting and it's, I don't know, you can argue it makes me lazy, but I do just as much work anyway. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you guys time to work on a lecture. So you have to prepare a lecture. And so you have to use either PowerPoint, um, what I've got, which is basically PowerPoint or blank things, or the whiteboard. But preferably, we'd like you to tape them. So prefer the empty PowerPoint screens. But you can also have PowerPoints like you know Sarah does it where they're all pre-printed out and you just read from them if you want. Or you, know, you give extra information on various parts. You also need to prepare homework questions. Let's say your average homework should have five questions on it. And make these legitimate questions. Don't make them silly questions like name one vitamin. You know, if you want, say, name the essential vitamins or what you think that someone should be held responsible for in this chapter. And then you should also prepare test questions. And what I'm going to do is I will use those test questions on the test, but I'll pick and choose. So let's say you should have at least three questions that you would say are test questions. And so I'll use questions if they're good. 
So half of your test, I won't say half, it actually ends up only being about a quarter or a third of your test, will actually be questions that you know are coming, and so you should know the answers for. Same thing with the homework. Obviously, I can simply take a homework question and, you know, reword it from saying one word to another to change it up, and it's still, to me, the same question. And, of course, you have to have an answer key. And what I will do is I will post those all up post those all up on the website for everyone and so your homework for the chapter 32 I mean you can do the homework you can answer the questions but the answer key will be up there for you to check your own answers so you've got to basically teach chapter 32 to me now I haven't figured out and that's what I was doing before we started lecture how to divide up chapter 32 in the past I've let people work in groups but we don't have a whole lot of people in this class and so I thought maybe we should work as individuals. And then I thought, well, you could work as groups. You just have to have more material for each group to kind of lecture on. So I don't know. Do you guys prefer individuals or groups? Or I could divide up everything, and if you worked as a group to figure something out, that's okay, too. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll work on groups. Um, think about or page through Chapter 32 and see what sections you kind of want. Currently, I'm leaning towards 32.3 to 32.6, 32.1 plus 32.7 to 32.9, and then 32.13 to 32.15. You'll notice there's a couple sections that are missing. There's one section that's a little out of order because you can cover the same part somewhere else. And I don't know if this evenly divides up the amount of work and effort but it kind of does that. And then, I don't know, maybe I'll say first come, first serve on showing up to lab, or maybe we'll just flip a coin and see who gets what section. But that's what we're gonna do on Tuesday and Thursday, so you're just gonna prepare, which means the following week, you're gonna give on that Tuesday and that Thursday your lectures. Figure that uh, for your groups, they should be on average of probably 15 to 20 minutes long, potentially because you're, you're lecturing on larger chunks of the material than people have done in the past. And then on Wednesday, we're going to start in on chapter 33 on bioenergetics. And so we'll have sort of two tests left. We'll probably have a test on just the amino acids and proteins and the nutrition chapter. And I think that ends up being kind of like a glorified quiz and then it's only like 50 to 75 points. And then we'll probably have one last test on 33 through 35, but we cherry pick the parts that we talk about in 33 through 35, meaning we don't lecture on the entire chapter for either one of those. We always kind of run a little short of time. Although, for you guys, you're actually pretty close to being kind of on track to, for my average class, if not just a tiny bit ahead, meaning we've been having a pretty good pace. Um, we should also point out that on Tuesday, you should have do what? Homework 31A, we said. That's the right chapter, isn't it? Yeah. Proteins. And you also should have the lab on amino acids and proteins due that day. So that's tomorrow. Meaning it was supposed to be due on Thursday. We never have stuff due on a test day. And so it's due the following lab period. And really, on homework 31A, there was only one tiny question on that that you couldn't have had done for Friday. So it's all stuff we've done. And then I would say on Wednesday, so this is Tuesday, Wednesday we should expect to have homework 31B due. And let's see. And I should put that this is still tentative but it's like 99% sure going to happen. Meaning if the weather is so bad, which I can't imagine this late in the year that the weather would be too bad to prevent me from going to Denver. Can you guys? Or if I break my leg and don't decide to go to Denver or something weird like that. Yeah, I was a little pissed off on Sunday. I was also somewhat happy in that I figured if I have to sit inside and do my taxes, then we might as well 